Hi, my name is Beth Azor, and I own shopping centers in South Florida, and this is my podcast, I Own a Shopping Center, Now What? So today I want to talk about tenant requests or emails and texts and phone calls we get from tenants asking us to make repairs on things when it's clearly in their lease that it's their responsibility. I am finding that there's a lot, when I buy shopping centers and I inherit tenant communication, I look at to see during my due diligence if the tenants are pains in the butts, are they good paying tenants, any defaults, and what are the other things that the tenants are asking for. Always surprising to me that landlords give in on things that they shouldn't. For example, in Florida, we have um, backflows, and it's clearly in the lease that the tenants are responsible for that, but I find a lot of the times that the landlords are paying for, for the backflows. Um, that's uh, in the back of the space and has to do with the water supply. Additionally, a lot of times when tenants call about leaks in their spaces, what we do is we send our roofer out. He charges us, I think, $250 for the inspection. And nine times out of 10, it's the tenant's air conditioner units that's causing the leaks, not a roof leak. If it is a roof leak, then the roofer repairs the leak and the 250 goes off of the charge of the roof. But if it's not a roof leak, then we give the report to the tenant and the tenant has to handle it with their air conditioning company. Speaking about roofs and air conditioning, we lock access to our roofs. They don't all have warranties. Certainly, if we build a new building and there's a warranty, we're very strict about this. We tell the tenants, you must call us in advance if your vendor wants access to the roof. We typically, when there's a warranty in place, pay for our roofer to accompany the tenant's vendor on the roof because we know most of the roof leaks happen when the tenant's vendors go up there and are cash- they're lazy, they're careless, they leave debris on the roof, and it causes roof leaks. If the property does not have a warranty on the roof, we do have lock boxes that we will give the codes to certain tenants, but our maintenance guy goes in pretty soon after the fact to check to see if there's any debris left or anything. So we try to really control that so that it, it helps with the longevity of the roof. We do PM roof PM, preventative maintenance, every year. It's in the budget, and that's in the CAM, where our roofer goes up and tells us things we can do, again, to extend the longevity of the roof. My maintenance guy probably goes on the roof at a minimum of once a month, possibly more, just surveying the situation and making sure there's no one been up there that's caused any issues. But other things that happen... Um, I have a new tenant that signed a lease uh, a few months ago, and they're in there constructing right now. And when they opened up the wall to do some electrical, they found some mold from some leaking from the tenant next door. Of course, they reached out to me as if it was my responsibility, and I showed them in the lease where that wasn't the case, that it's the, the neighbor's responsibility. So he now is working it out with the neighbor next door, but I think a lot of landlords would have just taken that on themselves, and they, we should not be doing that. A couple other things. The same tenant that I'm trying to get open found an electrical box in the back of the space and outside, but it's attached to the premises, and it was rusted out, and they were asking us to replace it. And I showed them in the lease that we were responsible for utilities to the premises, but anything attached to the premises, it's the tenant's responsibility. Now, of course, if my shopping center is 30% occupied and I want to help the tenant, it's obviously always our desire, but we can certainly change our mind and be a little more accommodating for the tenant and pay for some of these things or take on some of the responsibilities of these things. But I'm, my point is, if we do that, we certainly should tell the tenant, look, 
This is not the landlord responsibility, as you can see in the lease pointed here. However, to help you get open faster, I'm happy to take it over. But you should definitely communicate to the tenant that it's not your responsibility so they don't start calling left and right every time there's an issue because that would make for a very unpleasant and expensive relationship with your tenant if they just think every time there's a problem they call you and you fix it without pointing out to them that you're doing something above and beyond. A couple other things. I, for my vacancies, I don't have the water on or the lights on in all of the vacancies. I may leave the lights on in a, like we have a second gen hair salon right now that I'm trying to lease and it's got cabinetry, nice flooring, it's got chandeliers. So I have the lights on in that space and about every once a week I turn the lights on and keep them on about 24 hours. I have a very high traffic two high trafficked restaurants on either side of this salon. So I'm hoping that when people go in and eat at night, they see the lights on of this vacancy and see how beautiful the space is and maybe they know someone that might be looking. So I'll do that that for like a marketing tool, like a marketing technique. I would not do that if it was just a plain vanilla shell that didn't look very nice, right? Additionally, I don't have the water on in my spaces. What that does is that causes gassy, fumy smells because the pee trap at the bottom of the toilet gets dry and then the gas fumes from the sewer come up into the space. So in every space, we have a bottle of bleach. So right before a showing, I'll either tell my maintenance guy to go in there and put some bleach in the toilet or I'll do it. I'll get there a little bit early and then open up the front door and back door and kind of air it out. So that's a little trick of the trade. Someone men once mentioned that they do driver fluid. That's not the right thing that I'm saying, but some other technique, just putting water, someone said flush a bucket of water. The water's not on in this space, so it's hard to do that. So bleach, doing having the bottle of bleach in all of the restrooms is what I have found to be the quickest and cheapest and most efficient way to get rid of the smell. The other thing that I do, if I have a property that I have more than, let's say, three or four vacancies, I put a very small, no frills leasing office. I open a leasing office. So basically, what does that mean? I take the best looking vacancy. I don't care if it's 20,000 square feet or 1,000 square feet, the one that shows the best. I probably wouldn't do it with a 20,000 square foot vacancy because I do turn the lights on and the air. So air conditioning a 20,000 square foot space would not be a good decision. So probably one of the smaller vacancies, I put a little card table and a couple chairs and turn the lights on in the water, make sure there's toilet paper and paper towels in the bathroom. And I, myself as the leasing agent, I go and sit there once a week and do some work. And it's amazing. I just did this last week in one of my properties. I opened the office about three months ago and I've been traveling a lot. So I haven't had a lot of time to hang out there, but I was hanging out there last week. And sure enough, a barber with four locations walked in my office. And also, because you're at the property things, you get ideas, your leasing agent is focused more on the property, maybe they have lunch there that day. So spending a few hours there once a week in this quasi no frills um, office space in one of your vacancies is, is a really great idea. I used to even in, in the olden days is I would do an A-frame sign and put on the sidewalk leasing office open and put that out when I was sitting there. I might do that again now. I think actually that's a good idea. So that's another idea about the, the leasing, having a leasing office on site to have your leasing agent focus on the property, hang out at the property, get talk to tenants, eat at the property, see what's going on, and maybe you get a walk-in. The other issue that happens a lot when we talk about tenants and what they ask for and what we should give or shouldn't give is most of the tenants, many tenants, they misjudge permitting time and construction time. And it doesn't matter how firm you are. I tell the tenants all of the time in South Florida, it could take six months to get a permit. They never believe me. 
And so what happens is they don't jump on getting the plans done right away. They hire architects that are not familiar with the city that they're opening the store in. Sometimes they're out of state, which is a real big mistake. And then by the time they get the plans done, they give me the plans. I pay for an architect to review the plans and give them comments. It takes multiple times for, for, for them to respond to my architect's comments. And then they finally get into permit. And you know where I'm going with this. Usually what I do is I'll say it's six months. So I don't do a contingency on permit. The only time I ever do that is with a national. I would never do that with a local. So what I do is I'll say, I'll ask them, they'll say, will you give me time to open? I go, yes. How much time do you think it will take you to open? And they'll go, oh, three months. And they'll go, I think it's going to take you, if you're going to do work that needs a permit, it might take you six months to get a permit. Oh, no, it won't. And so I'll say, okay, I'll give you the earlier of six months or opening, and then you have to pay rent. So if you're open in four months, you pay rent. If you open in seven months, you pay rent at the end of the six months. Because they are um, in fantasy land, they think the six months is fine because they think they're going to open in three months. So guess what happens? The six months, as the six months is approaching, we, I'm in constant communication. Why haven't I gotten your plans? Why haven't you responded to my architect's comments on your plans? How's the permitting going? Hey, we looked at the city's website and we see that your plans are stuck in engineering because you didn't pay a fee. We're constantly communicating with the tenant. So as it gets to be 30 days before rent commencement, we're sending them an invoice. So your rent starts on September 1st. Here's the amount. It's reduced by the first month's rent that you paid, blah, blah, blah. And then they call panicked. I don't even have my permit yet. And I can't pay rent and you should extend me. And I very rarely extend rent commencement. If I think they've been diligent, what I might do is say, I think you've been diligent, you've been doing everything right, get open and we'll talk about it. And then I do go back and, and once they're open and they're paying, I might do something like do a half rent situation, like the first three months I'll do half rent. But if they have not been dil diligent and they've caused all of their own problems, even against some of the advice I've given them, I absolutely do not waver from the rent commencement date. And yes, this sounds that I'm being very harsh. And again, I'm talking about in properties that, let's say, are over 90% occupied. If I was 30% occupied, I probably would be a lot more lenient. So I hope some of these tidbits helped you with your property ownership. Again, if you like this podcast, please share it with other shopping center owners. Subscribe. If you have any questions and would like me to answer them on future podcasts, I'm happy to do so. Just DM me. Have a great day.